system testing, test automation challenges, and what testing is about in the digitalization era. Right? Yeah, okay, so we jump right in, right? So past to present, so I did take a reflection all over the history. And what's interesting is today, if you look, I saw that testing is the top 10 future jobs. That's pretty amazing. Uh, it's really perceived as the work in, especially in Silicon Valley. So uh, it's not a news, but since 2016, 2017, software testing is the biggest key subject. So something has happened, in my opinion. Uh, it's a key factor for economic success. Uh, so everyone who's in testing is sort of a finger in security as well. Of course, as the history goes, we always try to design a way so we don't get there. But testing is that fantastic net that will pick up whatever we have. So it's uh, definitely a lack of um, sufficient serious university education on software testing as the industry perceive it. And I think this is a huge problem. Uh, I think it's changing. Uh, I hear uh, people are telling me on these sort of old universities that, you know, before we had 20 testers, and now it's 160 applying to this course. And they only have one course usually in the program of, you know, software engineer or computer scientists. So instead of the first course where you learn to program, you actually have to learn how it works. <laughs> For me, it's an enigma. You know, why haven't we gotten there? So I think many businesses today still don't recognize why testing is. They perceive it as a cost. It's the whole, the whole issue is how can we reduce software testing. That's the mind frame of most people in businesses. It's just a cost. It doesn't contribute. I mean, it's the development, right? That's the program. But I think people's <coughs> mindsets got to change and it's starting to change to really see that you can't go anywhere without software testing. Of course, I'm probably preaching to an audience that have heard all of this before and it's nothing new but it's still good to remind ourselves because we need to pitch all the time to these business people and manager who have still perceive testing as a cost to be redu reduced instead of the key factor that would bring lower costs to the company and really save on maintenance etc. So uh, testing here and now. I think I'm going to talk, or I am going to talk about agile transformation that's going on. I have noticed that some companies are still in deep denial about this. Uh, and it, this will change for sure, because the business, which I think is a fantastic, interesting phenomena, uh, no scientific backup whatsoever. They just said, on a leap of faith, this is the way to go. So here you can really say we're in one when science fails and how basically good packaging in some religion uh, can transform the whole industry, in the Western world at least, because people can do it and people have done it, right? And then it stresses everyone else to release faster. <coughs> I will talk a bit about what that consequence has for software testing. And I, of course, since, thank you, Mark Florian, uh, I had this intro on Testomat, I will talk about test automation and test automated challenges and why it's not a problem solved, as many seems to perceive, having been around for a long time, <laughs> and, of course, end up with the digitalization. So my first question is, how do we know we have quality of our software? And of course the answer is, okay, we have tests, right? Because that's a measurement, the execution, and then you can do statistical sample and say, okay, we found five bucks, you know, we know, you know, this is the quality, right? 
So how can we know the quality of our tests? Now, already now it's like, yeah, but we know they're good. Yeah, how do you know that? Uh, of course, uh, the smart person says mutation test, right? That's the scientific answer. That's the only way to really evaluate if you test sweet is okay. Another way to say, well, we have coverage. And of course, without coverage, it's fine. How many coverage uh, metrics do there exist? We have experts here in the audience, but there, I'm sure there are thousands. Uh, at least if you, you know, look at all the namings, but whatever you can draw, you can invent the coverage. And I think this is the future also, invent a new coverage and become famous, you know. Um, but it's not easy if you talk about coverage, because what happens with some industries, they say, oh, I have coverage. And they say, okay, what coverage? Uh, statement coverage. Or if you're in a more, okay, we have MCDC, right? That already qualifies you knowing the difference between, you know, <coughs> or branch testing. But the problem is that coverage is usually measured on the code level. It's not measured very easily on the system level. And believe me, I tried. You can do it by wiretapping. You can do it by going into the processor and every time it swaps, you store away this swap in the processor in the code and then you do a reenactment analysis. Can you imagine the cost? And then suddenly, of course, in this big project, you did all this. Oh, we decided to swap the processor. <laughs> <laughs> because processors, they are hardware, it wears out, they change. So, of course, we don't really have those, but we are, this is what I think the forefront of scientific is. They basically see exactly, and then they have all this going sort of both back and forth from source code to the object and then back again, so refactory the code. And of course, it's not that easy. There are definitely steps there. But if you have your own and you own it and you can put trace and hooks, you can find your way through the program, right? Uh, so <coughs> we measure it, to be honest, on the unit test level, but we are talking about system tests, right? So. Of course, our belief is we have tested all the right stuff and we should trust this coverage. And uh, I, I'm being a little bit mean. Here is where we start to do opinions or what popularly call alternative facts, right? Uh, <laughs> it's like, okay, we test 100%. Yeah, sure, we have tested it all. Well, and then it, when you start to dig in this, it's like, okay, we ticked off every requirement. And I have been around places where they said, okay, four test cases per requirement. And then, of course, I had to, I have a tutorial, which I love to do with people in industry, where you basically say, okay, let's test an SMS, right? <coughs> And I especially love it at Ericsson. And then you go through all of this. It's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's one requirement. Test an SMS. It should be four test cases, right? So after they start to realize that you can send all kinds of GIFs and MMS, so all kinds of strange things in your, and it has limits and so on, then, okay, the whole day is sort of derailed, right? So you have already now a few hundreds for testing this SMS. And around three, four o'clock, I usually say, yeah, yeah, but that was the utility side, right? So let's talk about the server side, and especially in Ericsson, because that's our core thing. We do networks. Everyone goes, oh, you know? So it's very easy to pick a hole on how many requirements you should have. Of course, we hope for really detailed requirements, but anyone in model-based testing knows the difficulty of really targeting all those you know, requirements and put it in the model, and then you have everything that went wrong. That's never said in those requirement specifications. Yeah, so my thinking is, so how do we select our test cases? That, I think, is our biggest bias in industry, and especially on system tests. And here comes the key problem, and basically my whole 
talk in a nutshell, but who knows about system? Well, it's definitely not if you come from outside or you're an academic. The people who really know the systems are either a system tester that worked forever in all parts of the systems or a user because they actually see the whole system, right? So now you think going through the GUI, that's what I, I did some experience way back. But it was really an interesting thing, especially in our systems, how little you could reach of the actual software if you only tested it through the GUI. So this is the caveat of only testing through the GUI. And of course, you go around in businesses and they're just based on manual tests. And you're like, <laughs> but you're not testing your system. How do you know this, right? Of course, we are much more mature in that. So that's not the case. Um, um, yeah, in testing, it's actually a lot about opinions. And maybe that's why it's such a popular subject. I don't know, because our scientific basis is not sufficiently strong enough. And I feel like I'm in Fraunhofer focus. And here is someone who really, I mean, I, I know Ina Schifferdecker and I know some people here and I'm really in awe of how sort of systematically they build on this knowledge. So somehow I think German, Germany and Sweden uh, are really, maybe Finland, are really the really strong countries. Now I would say Sweden, but we were really early in driving why testing is important. And of course, England was there as well, or Britain or whatever they're called nowadays. Um, so the problem we have is what is right, right? What is right in, in testing? And because I say so, ISTQB, oh, that's perfect if you're a beginner. It's a bunch of consultants who put together and they were voting what was right because I had it in my book uh, so it has to be right, otherwise I have to change my book, right? Uh, so is that right? Well, a lot of people think so, within ISTQB at least, and I was there forming it, so I, I, I know from a fact, and thank God for we're trying to put more science in there. Uh, you can look at IEEE, which a lot of people here think, you know, that must be scientifically based, is this organization. Well, maybe they're getting there, but not when they wrote Swede book, right? So should we trust that as a, this is the core? Well, it's a start. Or if you look at IEEE, ACM, of course, where every scientist based their thing. So me and I don't know if you know Professor Elaine Vioker, who's been basically writing research papers in the beginning of 90s or 80s. You know, one of those who has nine classmates who have Nobel Prize winners, but she's like, you know, only what is called Anita Hall. Uh, so that's the female software, I guess, Nobel Prize. But she and I totally agree on this, that there are thousands of papers in there that are plainly wrong. But this becomes, because we have reviewers who don't understand testing, is well written and once you have gotten this what I call bugs in the system people keep quoting them and you're going yeah I also actually heard uh, a rumor from Klaus Wolins uh, you know his really serious book on how to do good use case studies in industry that every empirical researcher more or less quotes have they had done a study it's probably coming a paper where they have looked into all the studies and over thousands of these papers were you know, not following what they said, but they quoted the book. So we do have an issue, right? Um, I don't know. Uh, we can probably agree among all of these groups what's right. But I mean, of course, I'm right. I'm here. I'm saying, <laughs> no, I'm kidding with you. But this is the problem with science, right? So as long as we don't really stick to really core principle in an objective and we build on things that are a bit wobbly, it's hard to sort of capture the truth. So let's swap a bit. Uh, so what happened with testing in the Agile? I know this is what I call the Ericsson sickness of poor slides. 
we write so much text all the time, it's not good. But system testers and the testers' role actually got changed. Now, suddenly, the role tester hardly existed. We all became developer stage something. And we all sort of, <coughs> testers are not a profession in that same sense. Of course it is. But it was really moved into uh, being developers. And of course, what happens in the Agile transformation is that the Agile teams took over a lot of the testing. I wouldn't say all of it, but a lot of it. And they have the responsibility. And of course, it really boosts quality and management, quality sense in management, I would say. And also in developers, because if you're responsible much, much further, you have to engage. But if you look at a complex system like ours, it's basically impossible to know everything about everything. So you have to divide, you have to have concepts. But we have gone through this and we learned. I mean, we're way, way far down in what's the agile transformation and we're really fine tuning now stuff. So uh, it's possible. And we have a, still a very strong testing organization. But there is a push, of course, to put more and more people into the teams. So what happens also when developers, I'm not talking only about Ericsson, I'm talking also about other companies, is that what happens when you move all the testers in the testers team, is, or in the agile team, is that test lose focus. It, it becomes, because if you look and assess those teams, it's never 50-50, it's like, you know, one tester if you're lucky and then five, 10, the developers, right? They are basically run over, you know. Um, and what happens is it becomes about what developers know in the Agile team. What do they know? They know about unit tests. So therefore, when you look around and you see all this triangle, it's all about unit tests, that's the pillar. I was so surprised looking at what we think the fantastic company of Google they have amazing unit tests, but they don't have system tests and they don't have the concept of system tests enough. It was the same actually with Microsoft, but then Microsoft and then Google bought mobile, right? Different mobile, Motorola, and, and they were teaming with Nokia. And suddenly they all went into this telecom radio business and you could, you could basically see a shift in their mindset going from one year to the next. The shift was, wow, system. It's all about the system. It's the system. It doesn't matter if you have 100 millions of unit tests if the system together doesn't hold. And of course, this is one of the problems that is solved, you can say, partly by building everything together. Because integration problems are solved, but you have to have test cases that traverses the system. You can't have only looking at something in the small. So, I don't know, but for me, uh, the whole problem is not these low level tests. We know a lot about that. But system level tests, where especially when you talk end to end, when you build a whole you know, country network together with not one equipment, with not one software. It's, it's the system of systems problem. That's when things are starting to get complex. And it's absolutely lovely to see the automotive industry because they are very separate. So one is the engine responsible, one is the wheel response, one is the infotainment system. They were really separate. But of course, in this automotive uh, self-driving car things, things have to talk to each other. So even if you do it perfect here, if it doesn't integrate well, you know, the brake system and the engine has to cooperate. So this is, has been a learning, I think. Uh, for us, this is the key that parts cooperate. So, um, we had quality police, uh, that's a way, or we have, I would say that's a way to solve that you don't check in bad things in a big repository, especially if you have, you know, a million test cases and I don't know, 2,000 commits every hour. Uh, 
it, it becomes a change. You have to look at it. But in the 90s, we called it Big Bang integration. It's when you do too many commits. And of course, the whole idea with Agile was really small changes, so you can follow the change. But when you are a huge company with a lot of software, it all moves. So you ha how do you handle that? Well, there are many solutions of division and, uh, and so on in the software and separation and following it. But some have problems, uh, for sure, if they don't have the quality in there. The thing that really got well is all the tools. And, and I know I was in the test team and all the testers sort of laughed hysterically because when the Agile team is going to use all the test tools, they said, this is crap. And then all the testers said, we told you so, but we never got money to fix them. So suddenly this change of all these automation tools got so much better. All the test tools got better. The whole environment of building and integrating and testing the stuff, it's like a state change. And that's, that's really good. That's really the improvement. And the other real improvement is we all talk about test automation, right? So if we look at going from this waterfall with long iterations, so Agile is much shorter iterations and two, three weeks. But of course, the goal is to go DevOps. And this is totally system dependent. For some people, you know, the difference, like a web browser, uh, sorry. <coughs> uh, well, if you look at some systems, it's not, you know, of course you can do changes real life. If my video goes down, fine. Uh, it will restart in two minutes. That's okay. But, or five minutes. Or how long does it take for Netflix to restart at your home? Uh, but you can see some of this. The idea is, of course, it should be a continuous flow. You do monitoring. But to make this work, for instance, you have to have automatic fault localization. You have to look at automatic program repair things because you cannot tolerate faults and then if you're anywhere near safety critical you better want to test it first but and therefore everyone goes no way devops in the safety critical word but it's wrong because the thing is you're not ever fully but you will have incubation before you process it it's just the goal of doing devops is speed you will go faster, you will automate more parts of the processes, and the more parts of the processes automated, the less likely the faults are. So that's the way to learn. So this challenge is, of course, a whole different mindset of developing. So we can really talk a lot about what happened with test partly automated, suddenly in this agile, it's build retest, test prioritization is the focus. And of course, the big problem is this maintenance of test growth. And a very big focus, I would say, on unit tests, if you compare it or average it. Uh, in DevOps, I think it assumes this automated fault and fix, and that you have an end-to-end -end system alive. And this means that system tests are automated. Uh, and of course, to be sure you know what you're talking about, you need to have metrics at all levels. And they cannot be manually collected. They have, of course, to be automated. Which happens to be one of the goals in uh, what we do in Testomot, right? Um, so, challenges is, of course, we have to discuss what type of test. But we could see manual test going to automated test. Uh, I've done studies and noticed that we did not, we just automated the manual test. I think this is the most common fault people did in this agile transformation. They did not think program. They did not put the parameter hard-coded. It's hard-coded data, it's not a variable. It would have been so easy instead of having, you know, the test execution and the environment to have the test execution, the environment and a variable for the parameter. And then, of course, the result. We don't talk about the result. 
the result, of course, in functional tests and in 80%, 99% of all the scientific papers are true and false. But if you look in our own system tools, we had 11 test verdicts. Everyone had information on what went wrong. It's like, okay, true, that's fine, it passed. But false, was it stopped because of environment failure? Was it stopped because some other thing didn't execute? Was it stopped because it didn't build? Did it even run? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You want all that information. That was a carrier in the test result. And this is, of course, everyone who works on system tests knows that it's not a true false. It's a bloody analysis that can go on for weeks if you have like performance tests. Only way to solve this on system test level is automating it. And that's not easy. Especially if you have analog <coughs> equipment like, okay, it's the radio range. We think it's okay here and people sit and stare. And it, it's a lot to go into this automation. Um, of course, I do think, and my PhD was about the amazing lack of test design because we get to this ISTQB course uh, and we know how to do it in theory, but applying it for real, you know, what technology technique have you used? That's, that's really PhD material. There are gazillions of work. And I think when you talk to academics, test automation is all about test design, automating the model and, and so on. That's where all the know-how is, but in industry, all the know-how is, is how we execute it, because that's what the core is. And for me, it, it, it's not a difference. It's just uh, the, the difference, of course, they have pros and cons, each of these. It's equally hard to capture what the real world problem we are trying to solve in the requirement or later. Uh, it's different ways of doing things and it probably has to do with knowledge and that's why I'm a bit impressed with Germany because they are more understanding the design aspect than I think many countries are. Basically you can actually model away kind of a few problems but modeling is only as good. I've seen models gone really wrong you thought you captured the essence, but you weren't really there. You were better at the model base, but you weren't really understanding the customer and you missed all these failure modes, right? And then you trusted this model and it was like, mm, not really right. And it's like, okay, here we sit with this waste. Yes? Just a remark, if you have a good model, you have a good understanding. Yeah, that's also a good feedback, but you have to, no, still, it's a theory. A model is an abstraction of what's actually. Then you can say, well, source code is also an abstraction of what's actually executed. So that's also a model. And, and honestly, it's Ina Schieferdecker who told me everything is a model. And I totally changed my mind. She blew my mind on this. So it's true. The better you understand abstraction layers and the transformation between these, that's when you say, aha, okay. And, and I mean, people trust their compiler, but every 50,000 lines of code has a compiler bug. So who looks at the object code actually executing? I mean, it's a long span there. We trust our operating systems, but when you actually are developing and understanding the problems with operating systems, your mind is blowing. Of course, you can have bugs at every level, but of course, this is the trust, uh, what's happening. So. Challenges, um, ineffective test, mess of, uh, mess of uh, the challenge is a mess of test cases, right? Because you just moved it and the result is what, so here you talk about how many test architects, you know, how good architectures do you have? And of course you see that architecture and the test is equally important, but of course who pays enough attention? Uh, come on, how many of those are really true architects that go around and whip the agile teams that they're just putting in a whole of, lot of overlapping unstructured tests? No one, ah, maybe a few. 
What do you say? <laughs> Maybe a few. So from manual to automated part two, so we have this abundance of duplications, right? Uh, so wonderful scientific, you can work on cloning, detection on test suites, right? Because you, every agile team, and okay, if you have one, it's fine. If you have 10, that's where you lose yourself. But if you have hundreds, what happens is they just look at their problem and then they sign and they say, okay, should I look into that repository of a million test cases? No, I don't have time. So what they do is they create a test case to solve their problem, what the change was. And now you have a million and one test cases. And then you have two million test cases. And then you have three million test cases. So it's, it's actually a self-brought on problem. It's a lot of waste if we were talking waste as a key argument in Agile to do all these duplications. No one dares to take them away because you really need automatic scientific removal of these. And that science is not there yet. People are working on it. And of course, cloning, coverage, libraries, you can do a lot in the process, but it's really hard to do it after the fact. Reinstating it. So transforming into a new repository might sometimes be a good thing. So um, manual tests, doing things at once. Poor test cases. And of course, the solution is refactoring. But how much time? I, that was a study I would love to see. How much time is actually spent on rewriting to improve a test case? I think there's a lot of time adding a new test case. It's a lot of time, say, changing existing test cases, but actually fixing them up. There might be some really good teams who say this is, we can't have it like this, that actually goes through and sharpens this, but not at all the same level as the source code is done. Uh, ineffective tests, so the last here was hard coded test, uh, hard coded data, I talked about that. You have actually low data coverage. In these suites, you can have a million test cases and the most lousy data coverage. And of course, the whole idea is you separate it. Yeah, and developers code, unit test, we talked about that. The system test uses as is still manual or poor because why is it poor? Because of this verdict problem. It's not running these measurements that's hard. It's hard to say and uh, analyze. And today that knowledge is with people. And especially, I think I haven't even come into that, but there are many solutions to that problem. So industry, 99% is test execution, if you're not in Germany or university education, right? Uh, oops. So test verdicts. Mm, yeah, we could talk so much about that test result, post-processing, easy for functional, I've said this. Maintenance is really the problem. The problem with agile test automation is not the creation of test case, it's the maintenance of the test suite. You, so there is actually very little research in there and people have not solved it. And of course, if you have a model and generate all your test cases, you think you're home, but you need complementary tests. And of course, and then back that up in again uh, everything out and you need a lot of coverage on how we really covered or I think though tools like uh, Testona for instance are really great because they combine uh, they combine the model so to speak with the data coverage uh, and they use search based techniques it's underlying so there are support out there but they're not so easy to just grab and use in any industry it's a long way to rewrite those test cases. I think the thing we should talk about is the real issue with system test, which is the environment. I don't know if you have easy environment, but in telecom, this is, I mean, people call it flaky tests, right? So this is typical Ericsson network 
that's the lab. And of course, can you imagine testing something that should stand up there? <laughs> the radio chambers, so costly environmental optimization. And you, it's almost like sending things to the rocket. I mean, you just don't climb up and change uh, the equipment when it's bad. It's, you don't. <laughs> of course, I'm, I'm only saying one word now, drones. Okay, um, so another thing here about difficult environments is the solution here is we invest in simulation. And of course, I'm surprised of the lack of enough simulation workshops, basically. How to design a good simulation tool. And the problem with simulation is that they mimic hardware that works. So you never test real-time changes, you never test broken equipment. And doing that is, of course, fault injection. You think that's simple? Have you tried it? Uh, do you really have a systematic understanding what happens when things break? Of course, what happens is you are in there, so testing becomes pulling that cable, pulling that card. Does this, what does the system, you know, does it have redundancy to keep itself up, etc.? because that's system test flaky environment. Now, how do you do that automatic? How do you do that automatic online? Well, that's what Netflix got so famous for called this cow's monkey. They just kill things, but they trust the system recovery should work. Well, I would hate to kill that two second, you know, 112 call. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I don't think that will happen in our business. But um, yeah, flaky tests, hardware fails, get stuck, you know, glitches. So it, it, I think the worst thing is not that it's, when it's failing, that's good. When it's really failing, that's not, it's this bloody glitches. It's just down two seconds and it's up again. So when you check, you know, you think things work. But they have been gone for a while, so some data in there is lost. And what happened? I mean, how do you simulate that? And that's why, you know, honest companies, they actually spend all that money to test in real environment to make sure we got it right, we got the real environment right. And of course, it's very costly. But the problem is we should move the money into understanding better the faults we can do that's more like, uh, hardware failing on an intelligent way. So case monkey is plain robustness test, typical system test reliability issue, you know. Do you have redundancy in your system? Do you have reinstallation problems? Can you get it up, inject a fault? And what happens, right? And it's really, you know, hanged software. I, I, I mean, I like the idea. I think it's great. It's really you know, comes from hanged software. Thank you, Microsoft, you know. We actually know that sometimes just restarting is good. So that's built into our systems, automatic restart. If everything else fails, restart, right? Uh, the dependencies. So future of test, um, I think it's, and you know, and I know, and I don't have to say, it's analytics. I mean, come on. Finally, we got at least a half decent scientific statistical base. But if you do machine learning, you actually have to learn. So you need to know what's right. You can really, I'm sure you can really train your software totally crazy if you don't know your stuff. Hopefully we do. Hopefully we know what's right, but you can also go really wrong here. But of course, deep learning is even more interesting. We just let the computer in itself find things. But all of this has brought, suddenly we have R, fantastic statistical, you know, it's tools that did not exist. Now we can do completely new analytics on our system tests. So for me, what is system test, flaky test configuration all about today? It's about analytics because there are you need support as a human to analyze this result, what's going on in your software. 
That goes both for automation, telecom networks, embedded, anything you do. And I think anyone has realized that, and of course, that seems to be the money maker for being a PhD student, you know. People are grabbed before they finish the masters even. Uh, okay, so system test, why is it so hard? Uh, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but you know, when Ericsson's customer is an operator, they have their own system. So Dodge Telecom, T-Systems, whatever. Typical, so they have an equipment, and of course they are like anyone. We buy equipment here and there and there and there, and we buy systems here and there and then. They have a network. And here we are to move into this network. And how does Germany look compared to Turkey? Two totally different countries, maps, where you need the masts, how they integrate, etc. It's never a one-off installation. So when I hear people talk about installation, they probably think it's, it's like, you know, Microsoft, let's get it up. Now, have you ever tested stuff and realized there are not one browser? How many browsers are there? You know, so it's the context of what you do. What's the variety of this? So of course, product line testing and understanding is important. It's important to understand variations. It's important. And of course, I recently learned about software diversification, which is a whole new subject. It's like we deliberately uh, look at all the variants and see what we can do with it. It's really amazing stuff going on. But this is a way to basically tackle this problem of almost the same, but not really. And of course, every version of the software is a little change. So there is a lot here that adds to complexity. That's my thinking. So I added some, yeah. So modeling is maturing, so you'd be happy about that. It's, it's not only Germany now who sort of, but to be honest, my whole life I'm I'm getting older, I, I have to accept this fact. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, all through my life, I, I don't know if it's like 30 or 50 modeling-based test attempts at my company, only my company, that have started, partly succeeded, people left and then failed. But uh, the, idea, the idea is now the tool's maturing, but it still has a bit to go, and therefore I'm really, I'm really excited about this, you know, GUI test approaches to really bring modeling into the next generation. Because, of course, the technology, the techniques, that will change stuff. It's not super easy, but that's the way forward as I view it. And I think tools have gotten better, and we push it. User experience is suddenly something everyone talks about. And that goes into the tools as well. When they are easy to use, they will be used. My thinking of how do we solve all this, we put as much intelligence as we can into the tools so the user can use what the user is good. But it has to be some basic training, but they have the domain knowledge. So domain knowledge, that's usually unique for the specific industry, and that's not easily gained. So. I'm going to wrap up talking about the digitalization in the future. And I think it's very easy to say, let's automate it all away. My, basically, my goal is we don't need testing, right? Uh, and it's true in one sense. But if you look at just the DevOps cycle, why don't make all these processes as automatic as possible? It's like, what are you doing by hand today in software production? Or I shouldn't say production because that's copying a CD to a USB, right? But software development that you can automate. You can automate everything. Some are really tough nuts to crack. Well, that's the goal. That's where you want research support. But you should look at every step of the process. So I have a slogan, I still use it. It was some old manager at Ericsson who said, test, or, test automa or automation everywhere. Automation everywhere where you can do it. And, and that's such a golden star for me. Of course, we come into this modeling, generating things, automatic program repair. Sounds like science fiction. 
It's not. It's happening. It's possible. If you have good test suites, which it relies on, and that's the problem usually. But they're getting ahead of that. And of course, self-healing systems. You design for it to solve its problem. I think analytic support here. It, it, it sounds like science fiction, and I'm a, such a science fiction fan. I think it's fantastic. I'm really looking forward to this. And of course, I'm not at all afraid we will sort of be lost and all robots will take over. But, uh, you know, it will be an interesting future for sure. Jobs are going to change. But testing will still remain because things fail. Even in iRobot, things fail, right? <laughs> so we need to have testers. So it is a top 10 job. So my final point is there is still a huge lot to do in software test. And we do have our different views, what's the right way to go, but that's the plethora that leads things forward. I think that's good. We don't have to agree on everything. That's, you know, the good synthesis, antithesis, and <laughs> no, no, these antithesis and thin synthesis. So we're getting there. And of course, I have to pitch the Testamart project. It's a great picture, but yeah. So that's us yesterday. Um, cool. And what we are doing, I have to finish with that, is the next level. Assuming you already have test automation. So what are you to improve now? Uh, we're going to really look how to be much better in finding those holes in the test you haven't done. So through mutation testing, through all kinds of aspects, how can we find more tests that we haven't tested? Maybe expanding our data parameters automatically in the test suites. Uh, we have to look at test efficiency and speed. Maybe that is really automating those very difficult analytics in the system tests so we can really have a whole flow all the way. We're going to look at quality and test standards in some non-functional properties, typical system test properties here, and see if we can improve on metrics and maybe combine static analysis and sort of normal testing over and under approximation and squeeze in. So interesting stuff. And of course, we're trying to make this in a model where we can automatically measure in our test suites where we are and where the improvement is in a stepwise manner to aid people who are not as mature in test automation to become more mature in test automation. Because it's not only doing a test, it's doing a better test, right? So thank you all for listening and uh, follow me at Twitter uh, or follow Testamart Project. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you.